This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 913, recorded on Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. What is going on up there? Hi, everybody. I'm Blair Bazdrich, and today we'll fill your head with cockatoos, snakes, and Planet Nine. But first... Thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Balloons! Recently, an alleged, or perhaps obvious, spy balloon was shot down off the east coast of the United States after sailing over the country. China has claimed the balloon was mainly for weather-gathering purposes. It just went a lot off course. The question is, is that okay? Are you allowed to fly a civilian weather balloon across international airspace? Or is it a violation of some international rules? The short answer is yes. Yes, you are allowed to fly high altitude weather data collection balloons across borders, regardless of whose airspace it is. Partly because balloons don't actually last that long at high altitude, typically. 80,000 feet and above, there's usually only a few hours before most typical weather balloons will fail and equipment will parachute safely back to the ground. And partly because it's only for weather science, so why should anybody worry? After all, we want atmospheric scientists and meteorologists to be able to give us the best possible data. However, the international agreements around such balloons state that the balloons must be exclusively for weather collection not mainly for weather collection. And they have to be no more than four kilograms, not 400 kilograms. So whatever it was that was shot down, spy balloon, weather balloon, attempt to get better cell phone reception while roaming, it wasn't part of any agreement. So everyone everywhere, please stick to the agreements. If countries go around shooting down balloons carrying scientific data collection equipment, then we won't have that data. We really rely on that data for monitoring, forecasting, and detecting climate-altering formulations in our atmosphere. And look, spying too, because sure, why not? The 100,000 feet, you probably don't know what's up there. And even if you do, you can't fly a plane that high to shoot it down. So stick to the agreements or send your balloons high enough to avoid any sort of enforcement. Either way, don't shoot down anything we may need for our researchers here on... This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Good science to you, Blair, and oh, oh no, there's no Kiki. Yes, Kiki is not feeling well this week, so it's just the two of us. I know, so we're going to have to muddle through without her, but you know, the science must go on. Yes. It it does whether we do this show or not. Exactly, yes. Yeah. We'd rather you know about it, so we're, we're continuing. We do miss Kiki. Hopefully she's watching and she... You can say hi in the chat room. But um, in the meantime, we have so much science to talk about. Justin, what did you bring? Oh, gosh. Uh, I've got better brains through eating mushrooms. Uh, I've got, oh, an ancient uh, hominin story. Ooh, is responsible for the first tool use. <laughs> May not be who you think. And uh, Search Planet 9. That's been, uh, that's a, that showed up in the news. And, oh, a new thing to worry about, as if spy balloons and COVIDs and, and monkeypox and earthquakes and everything else that could, could get you wasn't enough. Now we have to worry about GLOFs. If you're not worried about GLOFs right now, wait till the end of the show. I want to say, that sounds you might be vaguely familiar. Oh, we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, well, I brought... My normal animal stuff, I brought some snakes, I brought some sheep, I brought some cockatoos, who actually, they might be the first with tool, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, 
<laughs> They're using tools. Shocking. Um, but then I also am covering some of the science that Kiki was very excited about this week, which includes, what is it? Oh, rings, um, solar panels in space, and uh, a new kind of birth control. Yeah. And uh, there's also some other ones that we might touch on. I might talk a little bit about that COVID story because that looks okay, really Okay, you go for it. That is yeah. all I could prepare. Yeah. Um, so as we jump in, before we start, just to remind you, you can subscribe to Twist through all of the podcast places. You can find us on YouTube or Facebook, or you just go to twist.org and you can find your flavor of Twist that you prefer. We're, we're everywhere. Yeah, and With of course that, you're 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 definitely listening to us as a podcast right now, also. Oh yeah, <laughs> because you know, we don't know when it depends that's on when. True, yeah, you're right. It's you and you and you, yeah. Anyways. You and you, know, you over there on the Stitcher <laughs> and the you on the Twitcher, and then you got to go down the whole list because then yeah. they know that they're the ones. Listen, right all all our listeners and viewers know they are very special. Yeah. So, except anyway. for that one one fella, you know who you are. Anyway. <laughs> Moving on, let's start. <laughs> Justin, do you want to start us off with mushrooms? Uh, yeah, let's let's uh, go right into this. So this is a study finding finds improved brain cell growth and memory from compounds found in mushroom species uh, Heric Hericium arenaceus, aka the lion's mane mushroom. Fungus has been used in Eastern medicine for centuries. To treat stomach aches, which has nothing to do with this story. It's also native to uh, Northern Europe, uh, North America. Apparently, there's <clears throat> it was so popular in Britain that it's now illegal to collect it from the wild because it became endangered there. This is published in the Journal of Neurochemistry. Researchers from the University of Queensland have documented increased neuronal growth when exposing neuronal tissue to extracted compounds of the mushroom. In the second leg of the study, extract was given to living mice, and it showed that they had greater short-term memory acquisition. This is the crude and purified extracts used in the study seem to have similar effects on neuronal growth to brain-derived nootropic factor, BDNF, a natural protein in the brain that promotes uh, growth and protects neuron health. This is when I wish we had the doctor because she's a brain scientist, so this would have been really helpful if she could have yeah. jumped in here. According to the co-author, Dr. Raymond Martinez Marmol of the University of Queensland, the research has implications that could treat and protect against neurodegenerative cognitive disorders. According to the supplement companies, there's a new must-take brain-boosting pill in the market. So it depends on who you're we were talking to you about what it's going to do. Uh, according to the doctor, our idea, our, our idea was to identify bioactive compounds from natural sources that could reach the brain and regulate the growth of neurons, resulting in improved memory formation. And sure enough, the compounds promoted neuron projections, extending and connecting to other neurons and increases in the size of growth cones, which uh, the brain cell uses to sense the environment that it's in, and establish new connections with other neurons in the brain, according to the research. So they also found that this was achieved at very low concentration, both in the tissue culture and the living mice, with the uh, improved short-term memory acquisition. So huh. pretty exciting, because this is one of those few things, like if, you know, you get to a certain age, and you, you want to stop doing... The, the things that decrease memory <laughs> acquisition. You want to start looking at things that are healthy for your brain for, for, for a change. And uh, it sounds like this might be something in that. We don't want to tell people to go out and <clears throat> buy this mushroom uh, as a supplement or anything like that. Uh, you know, the disclaimers for your consult or your doctor or what have you. But, uh, but I did. <laughs> You did. I'm a, sucker, I'm a sucker for anything that says it'll give me a a, a better brain. This is my complete. I don't even look at the back of the label. Don't even care what it's. I'm like, oh, okay, it says it's going to do it. I'll just believe it. That's how easy I am to be influenced by these things. Um, but there is 
if you are inclined, there is a research paper out there you can point to to say, eh, see, honey, this is why I'm uh, getting this strange mushroom powder and putting it into my smoothies now. There's a there's a paper that says mm -hmm. that it can do something, at least in mice in a laboratory condition. <laughs> I wonder what it tastes like because I I love mushrooms, generally speaking. I think that they taste awesome. Um, but it's, I think about a lot of, um, supplements that they're better off in pill form, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> is this a mushroom that tastes delicious or is this a mushroom that you're better off just taking the supplement? Ask me in two weeks because I've ordered yeah. both. Okay, great. I can't <laughs> wait for you to tell us. Okay. Nice. Well, mushrooms for your brains. Um, so moving on, I wanted to report on lunar solar panels which is something that kiki picked out to talk about this week um so this is from blue origin jeff bezos's space company um and they found that they could use the they could find and use key ingredients for creating solar cells on the moon's surface so silicone iron magnesium aluminum and more are just found on the surface of the moon and they were able to make solar panels out of them um in in kind of a simulated lunar soil so it's a material that is chemically and mineralogically equivalent to lunar regolith the the dusty surface of the moon and they've been doing they've been working on this for about two years so they they are hoping to market this technology to NASA because of the Artemis program, um, because they want to send people back to the moon. And it is much more sustainable to build things there than lug things into space from here. So they so also still, think... Even with all yeah. of our advances, it's still exceedingly expensive. Yeah, anything, yes, Anything that you're putting into space, let mm -hmm. alone getting all... Well, once, you, once you're in space, getting all the way to the moon isn't probably that much worse but well and i just... know like everybody always tells me oh it's a drop in the bucket but it always bothers me that we are removing matter from the planet <laughs> and taking but, it away not to bring it back but blair just, we're getting pelted with matter all the time we're probably still in a net gain i don't think so we've we've put a lot of stuff out in space anyway um they can use the same process they think to produce metals for building habitats and for other structures also um to make oxygen so it's uh they, they have all these ideas for how they can reduce the amount of things that we're bringing out into space and just make things when they arrive uh it kind of it made me think about star trek and the replicators and stuff but so here's the thing i can't decide yes do i want them to apply an anti-glare to it or not like do I do I want do I want to like I'm like oh gosh like the moon's all extra reflective in this one part now, but or is it cool to go look at like look see those reflective dots on the moon? There's well, here, people there. Here, let me there. share. There's a picture. Um, it's hard for me to do this and talk. I can't believe that Kiki does this every week. Um, but it's kind of perpendicular to the moon's surface in this yeah. rendering. So. Maybe at certain angles it'd be an issue, but I think most of the time it wouldn't be reflecting back at us. I think I actually I'm starting to lean towards I'd want to see a little little <laughs> gling a glimmer you of want to see uh, the moon humanity on at the you? moon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, I love this idea because uh again, I just hate us sending matter from planet Earth <laughs> out into space. So just I, I want us to get there and make things. I'd like that much more. Somebody needs to send Blair the breakdown on how much yes, matter please. the planet collects annually. So that yes, but I also the recognize math. the more we do space travel, the more it's going to be. And at a certain point, even if we're not now, we're going to be sending more matter away than we're receiving back. So it's, it concerns me. I will not live long enough to worry about it, but I, it yeah. does concern me. On the list, <laughs> on the list of things, I feel like that one should be pretty, yes. pretty low. No, that's fair. Uh, yeah, there you go, solar panels on the moon. Justin, what are gloffs? Well, I don't even want to tell you. It's you know, oh this is yeah, this is a. The headline here is something along the lines of 15 million lives at risk from glacial flooding." Glacial okay, lakes. So, 
What is a glof, though? <laughs> oh, that's a, a you don't want to know. Okay. I won't, I'm not going to bring it up again. I apologize. Oh, boy. Glacial lakes are formed <laughs> either by melted ice or creating a bodies of water, water uh, trapped within a glacier or by the glacier itself sort of acting like a dam forming a lake in an otherwise confined area like maybe a canyon or a ravine or something like this. Glacial lake outburst floods. Oh, shoot. There it is. Gloffs. Mm, gloff. Or, or what happens when those reservoirs bust and the water is released in a very abrupt way. Uh, sometimes enormous amounts of water over a very short period of time, like a dam breaking. This is actually one of the theories for the Younger Dryas extinction event, where in a mini ice age that took place on the planet, where somewhere in the Great Lakes area, a massive glough, uh took place. A huge inland glacier-bound lake had formed over the area of the Great Lakes. And then the end of it uh, near the Atlantic Ocean busted. And it, all of that water poured out into the North Atlantic in a very short period of time, changing the salinity of water there, of course, and changing the conveyor belt with all that cold, fresh water that normally brings heat up and changed the climate under the Earth, created a, a cold spell that nearly extincted people uh, on a an, around the Atlantic Rim, so big, bad, dangerous uh, glass was when it okay. was was a near extinction event for a lot of uh, humanity. So, anywho, we don't have to worry about that anymore because that was a long time right. ago. Yeah. Uh, only now, global warming is increasing the risk of glass everywhere that there is glacier. And high mountain ice. So these things are also they can they can happen pretty quickly because there's not there's not a whole lot of warning you get when an ice dam breaks. You can't just go look in the, like a regular dam. You might see cracks forming in the concrete or something of this nature. They can. There's all sorts of things that is happening in ice that's eroding away. You won't see anyway. The global assessment. In the areas of risk in these outbursts, this is led by uh, author Caroline Kaler, a doctoral student at Newcastle University in England. They focused on three criteria. The size and number of lakes in an area, because this is a global assessment. They didn't just look at one, so they're, it's, it's going to be rough estimates uh, everywhere because they did the whole planet. So they start with the size and number of glacial lakes in an area, then the number of people living within one kilometer of any main river or draining channel along a 50 kilometer path downstream from those glacial lakes and had an additional assessment of how prepared communities might be for such an event and they based that on a conglomeration of basically industrialized criteria how industrialized is this region with the level of education and engineering resources and that sort of thing in the area that are likely able to to mitigate they then ranked uh, the risk for each of these regions and actually found that the total are 90 million people across 30 countries live in basins adjacent to glacial lakes currently that's a much bigger number than i would have thought yeah that doesn't sound great <laughs> no uh of these uh 15 million people live within that that 50 kilometer of the glacial lake and with one kilometer of that potential runout track. So when we're talking about 15 million people in the high risk, all the other people in that basin also are going to be massively disturbed and, you know, rather quickly, uh, at risk of being rather quickly disturbed by, by these events. More than half of these people lived in India, Pakistan, Peru, and China. So these are areas where, and it's sort of an interesting there's an interesting possibility of why some of this is. Uh, in the high Arctic regions, in the Pacific Northwest, the risk was much lower due to uh, less population living, uh, less population density living near the glacial lakes. They tend to live further away. And also some higher levels of industrialization and preparedness. 
And so one of the things that, that sort of occurs here is that glacial lakes are a great source of fresh water. Mm-hmm. So there is uh, an, uh, lots of places in the world a high, you know, uh, incentive to live close to that source of water. And those tend to be slightly less industrialized because the more industrialized areas likely have access to that water by moving it through, pumping it out and moving it through water delivery systems, pipelines, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So that's part of why I think the, these, the populations at most risk are uh, denser and closer to the to these. But if you didn't have enough to worry about gloffs, just add that one more thing. <sighs> 90 million people living in the basins. It's, it's a this is one of those things where it's, I still hear people talking about climate change. Like it's a faraway issue. Like it's a nature issue. Mm-hmm. Like it's very separate from everyday humans. And this is a reminder when we talk about cl- like catastrophic climate events, this is the sort of thing. It's, you have your, flash freeze at the wrong month that destroys crops or freezes out entire infrastructure sections you have your flash floods you have a storm parade as we had in california that destroyed a bunch of infrastructure but now even so much farther on the spectrum you have your glacial lake outburst flood you just have like mm-hmm. catastrophic change in a space yeah. And this is, you know, this is, there's pockets of this everywhere. People that maybe don't realize that there's glaciers everywhere. And anywhere where there's a lot of high altitude, like you can run into this certainly in the Alps. Uh, so then you're talking about Austria and parts of Italy and other, you know, but population wise, it won't be as, as dense there. But this is a problem that's going to be popping up. We're going to be hearing about glacial dam bursts yeah. uh, going forward. Well, and as Ben says in the chat room in YouTube, he says, uh, people don't want to think about something bad that could happen to them. And that's absolutely right. But this is the thing about climate change. Really? Is that when... I do when, that all the time. <laughs> if you if you think about something bad, at least this is how I work. I know this is how some other people work. I'm not going to speak for everybody. But if you are picturing a scenario that could happen to you and you have no possible way out or solutions to it, it is much easier not to think about it. But if you have steps that you can take to make yourself safe through that situation, you will take those steps and you will prepare. It's like you live in San Francisco. You don't think about, oh, I, there might be an earthquake. That's going to suck. I don't want to think about it. No, you make an earthquake kit, right? <laughs> you like prepare yourself for the potential of something bad happening. This is one of those oh. situations where we're getting the science. We're getting the figures to recognize these things are going to happen. Yeah. Let's work together to prepare for them, make them less bad if possible. But ultimately, we know some things from climate change are going to happen for sure. Let's prepare our communities, our nations, our humans yeah. Yeah. to deal with it. Yeah, and that's actually something that's interesting in that what you said there. It's come up uh, in the news quite a bit lately about, oh, could the earthquake that happened in turkey and syria could that uh, california could happen there and the answer is yes and it has before and it will again and california as much as you if you're from california you heard people complain about building code oh the building code in california is the worst building code anywhere in the united states it's so restrictive and has all these these extra things you need to do and when those earthquakes happen in California, you're not going to see a lot of damage. You're not going to see buildings falling down or neighborhoods or cities falling down because preparation. Mm-hmm. They have prepared. They built it into their building code a long time ago and they continued to improve it and retrofit and done this sort of thing. Uh, so when we get those big earthquakes in dense populated uh, big cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles, and we've both right. been through a few of them, there's really not that much damage in comparison. Yes, but it also, I think it helps to recognize if you have prepared and knowing what regulations exist to help keep you safe. Mm-hmm. And that's what, what I'm what I'm trying to explain here is like, 
This is not a time to ignore these large impacts on climate change. This is the beauty of the science that's coming out now of saying, these things are probably going to happen. Let's mm. work to prepare for them so that the loss of life is less than it would be if we ignored it. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, the research like this can definitely be used in those communities that are at the highest risk to try to engineer their way uh, out of this, you know, either by by creating an artificial drain out track just in case the thing happens that would bypass the dense population. Yeah. But you're There's, not yeah, going to build that. Too. You're not going to build that without the science because right. then you don't have the paper to, study, to point to and say, hey, look, this mushroom had a study about it and that's why I bought it as a supplement. Yeah. And yeah, somebody asked in the chat room, I think it was Ben, uh, yes, it has been peer reviewed. That just means somebody else checked the, the science of it, not the efficacy. Um, well, let's leave Earth because this is depressing. And let's talk about something <laughs> outside. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. I, thought, I yes. didn't think we were going to announce um, so soon. We were from. And this is a story about the icy dwarf planet. And I googled how to say it because Kiki's not here, and I'm still gonna butcher it. It's Quaror. <laughs> Quaror. Qu Qu Boy, you did a you Quar did a lot of study there. You're still Quar you're still looking for it. Quar I, I I looked it up and I immediately forgot it. It's Q U A O A R. Um, it's a dwarf planet, and it's doing something really weird. It's about half the size of Pluto. It's beyond Neptune. It has a ring, which is the start of what's interesting. It is only the third ring to be found around a minor planet and only the seventh ring system in the solar system, which is, I guess, more than half. But still, anyway, um, they, they, they found a ring around Qu Quarar. But what's really interesting is that it's really, really far from the planet and when i say that it's like really really far away um uh, i'm gonna share an image so if you're listening please uh go to our show notes and look up an image of this the ring is just so far away um mm. let me use words to explain what far away means <laughs> if i could find them uh they are seven planetary radii the the the, the ring is seven planetary radii away from RR. So it's seven times its radius, which is twice as far out as the theoretical maximum limit for a ring system, which is known as the Roche limit. Saturn's rings, the main part of Saturn's rings, is three planetary radii away from Saturn. Okay, so I already have an idea what this might yeah. be. Yeah. My my guess, can I can I guess on it? Please. My guess is because this is this is interesting. This is a uh, Kuiper belt object. Uh huh. It's it's all it just happens to be also one of the stories that uh, I'm going to bring later is related to the Kuiper belt. Uh, one of the theories for for what Planet Nine might be is a planetary core, like a planet bashed into another planet and its core went flying around. So that's it would be very very dense. It's all the heavy metal part, of the the densest part of the planet out there floating around. If this was, if this could be a similar type of an object, if this could have been a destroyed bigger planet that just has its core intact, then then it would be denser than most planets. Mm. It had more more grav mass, more therefore more gravity than most planets. So what looks like seven planetary, what's it far away, is you know this is only a calculation of how dense the thing would be. Or how much mass and how much gravity it's exerting uh, to keep that over. So that would be my guess. That's a great guess. They don't know. <laughs> uh, as you call me. Okay. Yeah, they don't know. Um, it was previously thought to be impossible to have a ring that far out. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to figure out how to explain it theoretically. Haven't figured it out yet. As far as they can tell, it should not be stable. Yeah. It's But that's if it's a normal planetoid, right? If it is yeah. one of these cores, the size you would picture for a planet to be around that, 
that would that should naturally be around it would be much bigger because it's all it doesn't matter it doesn't care size is meaningless <laughs> in the in in planetary uh gravitational right. but like uh, mass is orbit. important <laughs> the how yeah how mass <laughs> massive it is is yeah. everything you're right this is mass is the most important thing. Uh, yeah. Well, they discovered it by accident, which I think is really interesting. Uh, they were investigating whether Quar Quar has an atmosphere. They were using high speed a hypercam instrument, um, which is on a telescope in Spain's Canary Islands that can spot variations in light from background stars. So it's still too small and too faint to be seen via direct imaging through Hubble. Um, so they they this is. Yeah, this oh, is wow. not a picture, obviously. Yeah. But um, so this is what they think. So this is the other problem. This is what they think is going on. This is the size of the planet they think it is, of the type they think it is, of the type of ring that they think it is. So you're right. There's there's lots of question marks here that are not answered yet. They just kind of saw this thing that went like, oh, my God, that should not be possible. So it's raising a lot of eyebrows. And hopefully we'll find out more. It's crazy to think about that that ring so far away. It looks so odd. Yeah, I, I like this though because this this discovery, this is uh oh this is the the main years ago we oh let me go get their names I have it I think somewhere in this other story we interviewed uh, Mike Brown and and Constantine Bat Batigan who had initially brought forward the Planet Nine uh, idea that some of these objects out there are affected by this, this hidden planet that we haven't found. Uh, and their main theory now, the thing that they've decided that object probably is, is a planetary core. So if we find an, if we find a planetary core on the outskirts of the Kuiper belt, that gives a good, you know, credence to their hypothesis because we found another, we found an example of that occurring that far out. Right? Mm -hmm. There's trillions of objects out there. They're all, uh, uh, all smaller than our moon uh, at the largest, even. Uh, many of them, many of them have, have, uh, have interesting, have satellites. Pluto has five moons. Even right. even though it's nice and small, <laughs> and a moon and that that orbit that can capture satellites and moon can also capture a dust ring right. and form yeah. a dust ring. So that part's not that unusual. The distance out, though, yes, the Roche is limit is the thing. Is the physics, thing that physics should not allow, according to what we understand, and therefore doesn't. And so then the next <laughs> explanation is it's yeah. really heavy. <laughs> it's it's got a lot of mass. It's very dense. Yeah, I don't know. I look forward to hearing more about Quarar. <laughs> yeah, the first thing we need to do is rename it. Hey, Apparently. listen, internet, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear how wrong I was. I know I said it wrong. Just let me have it. Quarar. <laughs> it's fine. Moving on. Um, I think that's all for our short stories. Uh, if you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. It, normally, Dr. Kiki would be here talking, but instead, I'm Blair Bazdrich, and I'm joined by Justin Jackson. Justin, did, did you want to talk about a COVID story as a quick COVID segment? All right, so here's a, I'm going to try to do this story. This is a, we haven't read yet. This looks like it's a, <laughs> looks like a press release from the University of Sydney, which uh, if you're checking, uh, I think that's in Australia. So they, what they did is they basically found a protein in the lung that naturally is blocking SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, CoV-2, COVID-19 infection. So I like this story because, uh, for one thing, it might help explain why a good portion of the population didn't really have the effects, the asymptomatic infections might have this genetic underpinning, might have this protein in their lungs uh, helping them. And, and that this, this paper that they've published mirrors two other papers that are just getting published out of Oxford uh, 
uh, Brown and Yale in the U.S. A couple of a couple of three universities, two other papers that also found this this new receptor protein that is stopping the COVID nineteen from uh, from causing uh, causing any problems. So it, let's see. Let me see if I can get down into the so the. It's a receptor for coronavirus, meaning the virus can bind to it. But unlike ACE2, which is its favorite target that causes all sorts of problems, this receptor does not support infection. It can stick to the virus, immobilize it, and in the process prevents other vulnerable cells from becoming infected. And they're describing it as being like a molecular Velcro to the felty spike of the virus. Anyway, the... This, of course, gives a potential drug target or drug creation uh, target because this wasn't something that we really understood or knew existed before we came up with the, our, our antivirus protections. This is a new venue, a new method, anyway. Um, also, they don't go into it at all in this study from what I can see here, and I'm just reading this for the first time, but my, uh, if I was to... If I was to guess, I would look for this gene to be, I would, my guess would be this is a Neanderthal gene, something that we inherited from Neanderthals. If you look at the rates of infection uh, by ethnicity, it almost tracks percentage of Neanderthal DNA. There's I'd a, like to see a, that graph. It's a matching ratio, the That's correlative in my head. Yeah. But the, so it may be that, it may be that the Neanderthals or Denisovans in that group had encountered enough viruses that they've built up this this immunity that current uh, other current modern humans have not. Now anybody can get this. There's no guarantee you would have this gene too. So that stochastic nature of some people having it, some people not, would be also indicative of whether or not you got this or that Neanderthal gene passed down to you, which would be much, much more stochastic, even within any ethnicity groups that are out there. So very interesting. Mm. Can't wait to hear more about this one. I want, I immediately yeah. though, want to know, want to know the history of this thing and, and see how it got to us because it's not when, whenever you see something like that, that's not in all current modern humans, then you know it might not be from current modern humans originally. Maybe. That's that's an interesting idea. There's there has to be some explanation for how even some people in the same house, one person would get it mm -hmm. and be sick with it for two weeks, and their spouse wouldn't get it. Yeah. So there has to be something going on there that uh that explains that phenomenon. So it's it makes sense it would be genetic it's yeah. i yeah i look forward to kind of hearing what correlations go along with that and exploring that it's very interesting okay. and and we may have had a better a better way of preventing uh we may have be we may be at the cusp of finding a better way to prevent future yes coronavirus infections. there is always that cuz yes this is yeah. not the last coronavirus we're going no 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 we're just they're at the, very we're good just at, what at they the do. beginning we're just yeah. at the beginning of it yeah they're skilled they're they're uh they're experts in their field well thanks everyone for listening to twist before we move Wait, on to our next is that the end of the show no oh, no good. we have more okay before we move on i'm doing all the kiki things you see okay yeah, yeah. Um, before we move on wanted to remind everybody how they can help us grow and do more every week and one way that you can do that is by going to twist.org and clicking on the patreon link you can choose your level of support you can donate to us monthly and help us keep the lights on here at this week in science are you ready justin it's that time of the show oh is it time for blair's animal corner with blair Except for giant pandas and squirrels. 
It's really hard to operate the music and the the video <laughs> and stories at the same time. Again, my hat's off to you, Kiki. It's hard work. Um, so I was trying to make myself big. There we go. It's time for Blaze Animal Corner. I actually have three today. I had one that I was going to do in the quick stories, but I did the space stuff instead. So uh, first, I have a story that I'm ticked off about this week. <laughs> I first read it and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then I thought more about it. And then I got mad. And then I thought more about it. And I got more mad. University of Queensland led a study to look at how snakes hear. They found that as well as ground vibration, snakes can hear and react to airborne sound. Just is this surprising to you? The snakes can hear? Not in the least. No! <laughs> <laughs> they played three different sound frequencies to captive red snakes one at a time in a soundproof room, observed reactions. Their the idea was, because snakes don't have external ears, people typically think they're deaf and can only feel vibrations through the ground in their bodies. What people? <laughs> are they biologists? Because I don't think that they are. <laughs> and there's one reason for that. If you look at a snake's anatomy in their head, they have literally everything for ears. They have a cochlear canal. They have all of the inner ear structures. They, they have ears. They have ears. They just have a scale that goes over the external ear covering. Lizards have that, some of them. Um, but it just because it's covered, that doesn't mean that they can't. He, like sound moves through things we know this like my neighbors can hear me yelling right now <laughs> and there's a wall there and that's a lot thicker than a single scale of keratin so this i'll finish reading the story so they wait, wait, three because <laughs> yes. I, there's other breaking news there's other yes. breaking news though i hate to interrupt you but i have breaking news yeah it yeah. turns out birds can hear yeah wait, wait hang on it turns out Frogs can hear. Yes, it, frogs. Look, they, oh, yeah. Hey, it turns out alligators can hear. It turns out uh, whales. Whales can hear. <laughs> That's a lot of things without the external ear. Just you know, I don't. Hear. Well, a lot. Of, most of those animals you mentioned have ear holes, which is the difference. There is okay. no ear hole. Do birds have ear holes. I, I yes. didn't even know. Yes, they do. Yeah, they're just covered in feathers. Um, so they played different sound frequencies to capture red snakes. They were non attestatized They were free-moving snakes. They do react to sound waves. Sometimes they reacted to human voices. Yeah. It, they looked at 19 individuals, looking at five genetic families of reptile. Their reactions differed, but depending on the genus, that which makes sense because they all have different reactions to sound, depending on if they're a predator or a prey or what kind of environment they live in and what kind of sounds mean what things to them. This, yeah, this is, this is what definitely a, we didn't need a study for that. Um, but the, I just, at first I was like, oh, that's so cool. Finally confirmed snakes can hear through their ears. And then I was just like, hold on a second. <laughs> this was never if, something I questioned. If you've ever been to a, what do you call a reptile uh, exhibit with live reptiles? You, there's never, I've never seen the sign that says, go ahead and tap on the glass. They can't hear you anyway. It so the, says, what what I not. What, if I was at University of Queensland, the way that I would defend that is that oh, the expectation was they're feeling the vibration from the tap. Because it is true that snakes can can infer a lot of information based on vibrations because their whole body is laying on the ground. So they have a lot more contact with the ground than we do. And so they have a lot more intimate relationship with vibration than we do. For so, I, I think it's one of those things where like people so think that saying, bats are blind because they're good at echolocation. Yeah. So because snakes are good at vibration, eh, they don't need ears. <laughs> so you're saying there's a very good reason for this study, if only to overcome uh, uh, some public misinformation or I lack of understanding. Guess. That? So this, this, this is really someone once again. Did we need a study for that? Yeah, yeah, actually, probably did. I would argue no, because all you have to do is dissect a snake head and you see all of the structures. Evolutionarily, think about how long snakes have been around. Evolutionarily, oh, 
Weeks, yes. At least. Hundreds of millions of years. So they've been around for a very long time. And if they didn't need the cochlear canal or the temporal membrane or like any of these things that are part of an ear, if they didn't need those, they wouldn't have them anymore. Well, they could be. So that's not like whales have toes is like the example, you know, the vestigial. But they're, but they're vestigial. This is yeah. a fully developed okay. functioning structure. It is not reduced. It is not different. It is the same. So all you need to do is look and go, huh, they have ears, though. <sighs> hmm. Maybe they use them. I don't need to talk about this too long. It's just... It, I... Why? It's, it's fine. Snakes can hear. Let's get over it. All right. So... <laughs> Moving on. Um... Justin, do you have any friends that you're like very friendly with and the basis of your friendship is shared trauma? You don't need to tell me what it is, <laughs> but is that ever like, you're like, oh man, remember this one time we went through this crazy experience and it like made you tighter, right? Yeah. This is, this is a common human experience. Well, def yeah. Define trauma. No. No. No? You've got a very easy I, life, is what you're telling no, me. No, I Okay. I don't know. Really, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe what uh, maybe they were traumatic. I should ask them. I was like, hey, remember when we had that fun, really fun time? And they're like, Oh yeah. Okay, let me reduce like, the, I don't know. the verbiage. Let me use the verbiage from the scientific study. Have you ever gone through a stressful experience that you have later bonded over? Oh, probably not. Yeah. This is a very common human thing. You're like, oh, man, remember that time we had that, you know, just think about like, oh, we had that one teacher that was really terrible and they like, blah, 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 and they, and they gave us all crazy grades and they assigned us homework on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And, you know, you like to talk about crazy stuff that happened to you with your friends. This is like a very common thing. Or like, remember that time that we lost our bus pass and we had to walk through a really weird neighborhood and we got lost and like you know this is a very normal human experience is to bond over stress so the the commonwealth scientific and industrial research organization in australia wanted to study this in sheep because for one prior study has shown that sheep are able to recognize and remember faces of other sheep and for two prior research shows that humans tend to bond when undergoing stressful events. So those two things together, they're like, hmm, if they can recognize each other, if we stress them out a little bit, will they bond over that stress? So what they did is they took 70 adult female sheep who were unknown to one another. The group was divided into seven subgroups of 10 ewes each. Some of the subgroups were exposed to different stripes of oh, stress. They're about, to, they're about to traumatize these sheep. They weren't traumatized, yeah. they were stressed, and I will I will say none of them were harmed. So let me explain. So they were they were exposed to stressful events while other groups were not. They were all normal events in the day of a life of a sheep, but they're a more stressful moment than when they're just grazing. One was being herded by a dog, one was being transported in a trailer, one was being collared and held by a human. And one was simulated crutching. So it wasn't even the actual act, which is when they remove wool from legs and their tails using electric clippers. And they're, they're basically the same clippers you would use on your head or your beard or whatever. And afterwards, they were put on, uh, they were fitted with a GPS device so that they could see who they hung out with in the pasture. Initially, the sheep who be had become acquainted at the start of testing before they were sent into their different areas to have their different stressors. They moved closer to one another. Oh, hey, I'm, I remember you. But shortly thereafter, the sheep that, that were stressed, that had gone through their stressful events, left those and instead found the other sheep they were in that stressful event with. Really? Yeah. yeah. The sheep that had not undergone stressful events stayed with the original group, the sheep that they met at the very beginning. So they, they posit here that, um, these sheep had bonded in the same way that humans do to stressful events. So basically they were like, Oh, Hey, you were in that crazy dog herding thing with me. <laughs> I'm going to hang out with you. So sheep who go through shared stressful events tend to huddle together compared to sheep who do not. 
Wow. So next time, next time you're uh, looking for a way to do some corporate team building and you want your, <laughs> your team to come together. Get some border collies. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, find a way to create a traumatic experience. The the fun times apparently aren't going to be as useful in building team camaraderie. But if you can stress everybody out, announce that there's going to be company-wide uh, layoffs and they're right, looking right. at your division specifically. And then and then let them off the hook. Well, again. Them, well they look like you're going to keep everybody here. And everybody's like, oh, gosh, we got to stick together from that day on. Uh, this could be useful. Think about a lot of corporate icebreakers that exist. And I think those are simulated stress. So there's like, um, use these toothpicks to create a structure or like, um, go find X, Y, Z in the building um, or, you know, scavenger yes. hunt, you know, these are simulated stress. There's no stakes. Or how, or how all of, uh, how all of right wing media operate. Oh, fake stress. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy. Fake news stress. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, this might have, people might have been. Are you are this. you just describing our our tribalistic nature in the United States based on political affiliation is all based on stress? Well, that's well, an interesting if, idea. <laughs> if you look at, I don't know that it works as well on the left. Maybe it does, but I definitely see the the right uh political machine focused on fear and stress mm -hmm. uh inducing subjects or making otherwise innocuous subjects sound frightening and stressful and then maybe that causes a a, a stronger coalition of the stressed and afraid to stick together against whatever well now i want to find you no, i deleted no, we can't it have help here. I deleted oh, no, it, so now I need oh, to go into my trash. History. But, um, oh no, where is it? The Democratic Party sent me an email today mm -hmm. <laughs> that said, no, I cannot find it. It said, like, uh, you'll never guess who's running as a Republican for president now. And then I opened it, it was like all red letters, really big. It was, it was, it was fear mongering for fear -mongering. sure. Yeah. Give us some money. This is bad. It's so I think, you know, it's pretty standard. Anyway, that's we're very far away from sheep now. Um, let's leave the sheep and let's talk about cockatoos. Cockatoos, the pretty much one of the only things we talk about with cockatoos on this show is that they are good at tools. Tools, yes. This is the latest kind of breakthrough in what cockatoos are capable of with tools and it, i i love this story goffins cockatoos have been added to the short list of non-human animals that use and transport tool sets ah. this behavior has only been previously reported in chimpanzees and humans and humans, of course. Yes, we have literal <laughs> toolboxes. And so uh, these cockatoos carry multiple tools to their work site when the job calls for it. Previously, they've been shown to use and manufacture tools. A recent study of wild-caught cockatoos reported that they can use up to three different tools to extract seeds from a particular fruit in succession. Up until now, researchers weren't sure if it they just used something and they were like, oh, now I need something else. Or if it was part of a plan, I'm going to use this and then this and then this. And so they wanted to see if there was a plan and the tools were part of a set or if they were just using three tools because they used one and it didn't get the job done and they moved on to the next one. These are two very different levels of thought. Yeah. So it's possible that what might look like a tool set is instead a chain of single tool uses with the need for each new tool appearing to the animal as the task evolves. So the way that they did this um, before I get into the whole explanation, the long and short of it is they put a task far away from where the tools were. And so the cockatoos had to prepare and bring the appropriate tools to the location. So here's how they set it all up. It was inspired by the termite fishing chimpanzees in Northern Congo, who they've done this study with to see about tool sets. 
And so they were able to collect the termites, the chimps, via a two-step process. First, they used a blunt stick to break holes in the termite mound, and then they used a long, flexible probe to fish out the termites out of the holes. So what they did is they tried to replicate that situation with cashews. They presented the cockatoos with a box containing a cashew behind a transparent paper membrane. I picture kind of like wax paper almost. Um, but to reach the cashew, the cockatoos had to punch through the membrane and then fish the cashew out. They could not use one tool to do this. They were provided with a short pointy stick for punching holes. That's not going to get the cashew out for you. And then a vertically halved plastic straw. It's like a little scoop for fishing it out. Seven of the 10 cockatoos taught themselves to extract cashews successfully by punching through the membrane. And two of them completed the task within 35 seconds of their first attempt. Wow. And no, this is not something that they already had innately in their brain because they don't have an equivalent foraging behavior in the wild as far as we know. Also, each cockatoo had a slightly different technique. So that's the other thing that tells you it's not just something that cockatoos know how to do innately because they all did it differently. Next, they wanted to see if their tool use was flexible depending on the situation. So they presented each cockatoo with two different types of box. One had the membrane and one didn't. So in one case, you need both tools. In one case, you just need the, the little scoop tool. The cockatoos were given the same two tools and they acted according to the problem. Sometimes a tool set was needed. Sometimes only one tool was enough. All of the cockatoos mastered this test. Uh, they were able to recognize when a single tool is sufficient, but um, they engaged in kind of a different behavior in the choosing phase. So they would pick one up, pick the other tool up, pick the first one up again. So they kind of were thinking it through before they picked up a tool. The last thing they wanted to do to see if this tool set they could really think through what do I need for the task ahead was putting that distance part. So figuring out how they would transport the tools on an as needed basis. So they put the cockatoos through a series of increasingly challenging trials to test the boxes. First, they had to climb a short ladder. Then they had to fly horizontally. And in the final test, they had to carry the tools while flying vertically. They were only sometimes presented with a box with a membrane barrier. Sometimes. They were not. So they had sometimes they needed both tools and sometimes they didn't. Some cockatoos learned to carry the tool to tools together. They would actually put the short punching stick into the groove of the half straw so they could carry them at the same time. And then and then you're ready for anything. Exactly. And so they they did that when they were presented with the box that had the membrane on it. Most of them transported them on an as needed basis. Um a couple of them made two trips when necessary, but most of them were able to figure that out. But one cockatoo, Figaro, he always brought both. He's the one you're talking about. He's the prepared yeah. individual. Just just don't overthink uh, the job ahead. You never know what you're going to run into. Bring all the tools. Yeah, bring the your toolbox. The last box. thing you want to do is have yeah. to load oh, up the van, your hammer. drive no, back to the workshop, go yeah. searching through the right, oh, which tool do I need? Yeah, have it all there on your work work vehicle or in your, your, your talon, clutch, whatever. <laughs> this is Figaro right here. Your... This is Figaro bringing his two tools in his mouth, yeah. in his beak there every single time. I want to be prepared. Yep. So that's definitely a whole extra layer to tool use where you can use tool sets and anticipate need for tool sets. Very neat. Oh, cockatoos, you're so smart. Yeah. So very smart, but then also, what does that tell us about brain size and tool use? Brain size doesn't mean anything. Doesn't I'm sick of anything. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's all silly. I mean, it's within within specific clades, it matters. It depends, right? This is what we've learned is like, you can't compare a human brain to a bird brain, but can you compare a cockatoo brain to an ostrich brain? No, you can't. <laughs> you have to, yeah. Does it matter? Does it matter at all? There's some yeah. science that says it does. I don't know. I'm, I'm unconvinced. 
More on that later in my uh, my uh, oh, great. one of my stories coming up. Too. Well, speaking of that, size and tool use. That's it for the animal corner. So bring it oh. on. Bring on the tool use, Justin. Okay, goodbye, Animal Corner. If you're just tuning in, you're still listening to the show that you started tuning into when you, when this all began. Uh, it's called the uh, whatever. What's the show called again? It's called This Week in Science, Justin. This Week in Science. That's right. That's the uh, show. And no, it's we called also... This Week in Science, comma Justin. That's what it's called. Comma Justin. <laughs> And uh, so we have to, this is, we have a, a, a fake station break, right? Stay tuned for more of This Week in Science. If you are interested in a twist shirt or a mug or other item of twist merchandise, head to twist.org and click on the Zazzle link to browse our store. End twist merch ad. Oh, wait, I guess that's <laughs> not supposed to read that part. So <laughs> we're talking, this is perfect timing. We were talking about brain size and tool use and, Gosh, it looks like they had this whole tool set and tool selection and use and really quick at figuring out how to use these tools just from a couple of uh, cockatoos. This study published in the journal Science, researchers say they found the oldest example of old one stone tools being used to butcher a large animal. So these Until old we tool- find an older one. <laughs> yeah. So Bill, oh, this is, but this is the oldest one right now. Old right. one tools were used for over a million years and they aren't the oldest tools ever found there are older cruder stone tools by about a half a million years older than old one tools but they but the old ones are of a consistent style of tool making that is first seen in east africa around 2.6 million years ago and it then spreads across africa the middle east europe Asia over the next million years, and every hominin at some point is using this tool set. Any every ancient hominin, you know, uh, of that era, that era seems to be using these tools. This new report from Kenya, Kenya identifies tools dated between two point six and three million years old. Again, previously the oldest dated around two point six million years ago, and eight hundred miles away. From this location in Ethiopia. So the site is the earliest evidence of large animal butchering, and in this case, it's hippos. Which for ancient uh, hominins. You talking about the world's most deadliest game or what? (laughs) Yeah, it's the it's like the deadliest creature on the planet. And (laughs) 2.6 2.6 to 3 million years ago, we're all we got hominins who were already apex predatoring the uh, the environment with these stone stone tools, or okay. or it was scavenging. It could have been that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was gonna say. It's, but yeah, this I, is this is butchering and rendering and removing meat from from hippos. Okay. Which, yeah, no no slouch if it's from scavenging. That's also great. That doesn't lessen the find, really. No, but it's because there's no evidence of hunting that we can uh, point to on this. So it's likely to scavenging. Perhaps most interesting of all, there were a massive pair of molars found on this site belonging to, to Paranth... Uh, I'm going to mess it up. Paranthropus. It's, I believe it's Quarawar. <laughs> Paranthropus is, is a, isn't an ancestor. This is, this is the side branch of human ancestors. This is, this broke off before Australopithecus. This is going into the way, way back machine. And it's the only evidence, it's only a couple of molars found on the site, but it's the only hominin evidence outside of the tools. And it's not our ancestors using them, from what we can tell. So this is a distinctly different early hominin than Australopithecus that was also really existing in the same age. And these, uh, the they went on to both were lasted for like another million years or so. Well, was, has, I mean, we just talked about birds using tools. Like, it's it's a convergent trait. <laughs> convergent we were not trait. the only ones. 
It could be. Could be. So here's the problem. <laughs> okay. So this is this is a, a site. This is very different. Huge uh, uh, molars. They have a sagittal crest, kind of like a gorilla. That bony ridge on top of the skull, which would have been an attachment point for really strong chewing muscles. It's been assumed that they ate for sometimes that they ate really hard foods or chewed a lot of grass, and that's what they consider. They're thought to be vegetarians using these giant molars and this big chewing muscle on their jaws for breaking down vegetation. The thing is, they find that these tools were largely used for breaking down vegetation, as well as for, for rendering all sorts of animals that were there, the largest of which were, were three hippo remains uh, that they found. It had a larger brain case than our line of ancestor at the time. Brain size isn't everything, but it's not nothing, uh, especially when you're talking about, well, supposedly when you're talking about ancient hominins, but maybe not. The discovery also makes it potentially the oldest Paranthropus discovery, the oldest being around 2.6 million years ago, 800 miles away in Ethiopia, which... Also is where some of the oldest stone tools have been found for, for this particular manufacturing style of old one. So wait a second. Now, now we've got, okay, the oldest version of these, this manufacturing technique. And there is also a toolkit in these. There's, there's smashers, there's cutters, there's slicers. They have a, a, a toolkit that is used Sometimes on vegetation, sometimes for cutting uh, and removing, rendering animals. So they they have that same, they maybe maybe three or four tools just to outdo the cockatoos. I guess the, the cockatoos might have more than that. We only gave them two in that example. These all just look like rocks, though. <laughs> they do, but they um, but when you find them all collected together with rendered animals, and you can find the rendered animal isotopes or what have you on the on them and they're all hammered out the same way so that they were all, all right. made in the same way this is this is how these are identified because uh truth be told they are just rocks yeah that is also it's also very true they are just rocks that was our first technology fair so so what's interesting so then so then in this discovery we're finding this offshoot this earlier offshoot paranthropus associated with these old one tools and animal rendering and our other previous example oldest example 2.6 million years ago 800 miles away of these tools is also where we have the other oldest example of paranthropus turns out when looking into this the leakies have discovered paranthropus and associated with the tools that they were finding. And in one case, uh, there was a finding that was even showed animals that were rendered. But then when they found the early homo species that had the larger skulls, they immediately decided that that's who created the tools. <laughs> like, it can't be these guys. Back to brain size again? Come yeah, on. Yeah, so, so the actual earlier evidence already associated them and this was a, a later find. I think this was a 1.7 to 2 million year old find where there was a, a, a more a larger brain cased hominin uh, or ancestor of ours that was running around. But because we we'd already found evidence associating them with these tools and with animal running, but because there was a larger brain hominin running around there, they oh it must be must be that one guy that did it that fella uh, right so. This is just then confirming the misdirection that took place was a misdirection and that they, yes, can be associated with the tools and with rendering and now are the oldest example of it, mm -hmm. which means and once again, our, our, our ancestors may have borrowed a technology, right? Yeah. not invented, <laughs> keep seeming to happen, keep seeming to, to just sort of. It's a compliment. Hey, that's a it's great idea. The finest form of flattery, right? Yeah. So, but this sort of does change 
A couple of things. Yeah, the site had at least three individual hippos there. There were 330 artifacts recovered, over 1,700 animal bones in the site. Uh, deep cut marks from the hippo's rib fragment and a series of short parallel cuts on the shin bone of another. They also found antelope that showed evidence of hominin slicing away with stone flakes having been crushed by hammer stones to extract marrow. There's also it very much changes what we thought Paranthropus Paranthropus. What am I at? Am I adding? Yeah. Paranthropus uh ate. Not just a vegetarian or a you know omnivore that's eating grubs and grasses, as as we have evidenced in, in later versions of it uh in different regions in Africa. But uh yeah. So the, the re and they've also noticed that they're the wear on teeth of ones that they found previously wasn't what you would expect from something chewing really hard uh, matter. So even despite having these big jaws that were built for the task, and one of the reasons why we might not be seeing those wear marks, they had other tools for that. They were rendering plants and animals. And so. if you were curious about how long hippos have been around, as I was, I just Googled it. And hippo ancestors have been around for around 20 million years. Um, hippos themselves, as we know them today, the fossil record shows about 1.5 million years. So a uh, hippo-like thing has got to be what this is. Unless this is pushing the hippo fossil record back farther. Maybe that's, maybe that's being overlooked in the telling of this tale, is that hippos know. are much older than we thought they are. Maybe. But also, if it's a hippo ancestor... They may have been even bigger. Yes, or that, smaller. Is, that did occur to me. Or yes. smaller. Or smaller. It could, could be their render. You know, it would be terrible to find out at the end of this story, which I don't have any, that the hippos they found were the small size of cats. Right. Small cats. Right? Like, no, they, I'm sure. Like, oh, well. <laughs> I'm sure they're comparable because they have the teeth, right? So they know generally how big the animal. Oh, so actually, hold on. No, they have the teeth of the humans. They have the molars of the humans. Uh, hominids, the, hu the, the, the hominids. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm curious. But they have, so they have bits of hippo though. They have bones. They've got stuff. rib so, and everything else. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. It's hippo. So I'm gonna assume two point nine to three million years old. Yeah. Where, wherever you got your, uh, wherever you, that's why you don't trust the Google. <laughs> I found a few different sources, okay. um, but that's. I mean. It, it's also possible that they could have just said hippo because it is a hippo relative that is approximately the size of a hippo. And then who really cares? So <laughs> that's not what this study's about. So I appreciate that, but I was just kind of sidetracked on that. Cause I was like, man, how long have hippos been around? So anyway, um, that's very cool. I love this idea that, uh, the tool sets are <laughs> ancient. And, uh, ancient and not ours and not yeah, we ours. don't have like like no. not even like it was one thing when you know like the the incremental removal of current modern humans from inventing anything like oh yeah we came along with our biggest brains and our cognitive abilities and we made fire and tools and did all this oh turns out fire was already being used yes. oh and the to tools much older yeah. the stone tools used much older than current modern humans it's our ancestors that invented. What's that? They borrowed it from somebody else. From the neighbors. Okay. <laughs> Where now we're finding out that we we just they're like, can I have a cup of sugar and also your tools? That would be great. And also, can you show me how to use your tools? Yeah, I would appreciate uh, it. Human That's human lineage has been borrowing a lot of technology over the years. Hey, it's what we do best. Hey, hey, that's a skill set. It's fine. <laughs> I, there's no shame. And borrowing a good idea. My last story tonight uh, kind of touches on some of the stuff that we have talked about. This is the search for Planet Nine. <clears throat> so we've uh, we interviewed Mike Brown and Constantine Vadigan, uh Gosh, like four, uh, four-ish years ago about uh, about Planet Nine. So the idea is there's uh, the outer, when you get past Neptune, we've got the Kuiper Belt. 
giant donut that encompasses that that region. There's like we were talking about before, trillions of icy objects out there that are smaller than our moon. Some much, 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 of course, smaller than that. Even Pluto is is one of the things that got removed as being a planet uh, by Mike Brown because it doesn't clear its orbit. It's it's in that Kuiper belt. It's in there with other objects, other dwarf planets, other things that have satellites and moons in that big cluster of icy objects out there. So on the outer edges, there are some anomalies. There's a bunch of objects that are cluster, have an orbital cluster, which means that they, as things go around the sun, they don't always go, they don't go in a perfect circle. They sort of have these sometimes elliptical paths. And these objects on the outer edges of the Kuiper belt all have a, an ellipse or an elongation of their orbits in a, in a specific direction. They're all in the same direction. And that's how, that's how the scientists first started looking at, like, why is that? What would explain that? And, you know, the, the Caltech researchers were fresh off of having killed Pluto. And they're out there hunting for another thing, to, idea to kill. And then like some people were like, oh, maybe it's a planet. They're like, no, it's not a planet. We're going to go in and prove to you another planet isn't a planet because it doesn't exist. And by the time they were done studying it, they were like, well, it's got a 99.8% chance of there being a planet. <laughs> so people started looking for this, and they haven't found it. And it shouldn't be surprising. It's, it can't, it's not that it's a mystery that they haven't found it. It's Further away than Pluto, further away than this uh, thing you're talking about, the, the, we were talking about earlier, it were, that Hubble hasn't even gotten a good look at. Teeny tiny, we out there. Only problem is the mass needs to be five to ten times the mass of the Earth. Well, then it should be, you know, bigger, you would think, than a lot of the, than any other object really in that Kuiper belt. You're talking about something that's multiple Earth masses. So there's three theories of why this thing, well, four, I guess. One, it could just be a planet. We <laughs> haven't spotted it because things are far away and it's hard to see anything, especially if you don't know its exact orbit. So they narrowed down its exact orbit. They've got a gun range. It's still celestially large area, but they have areas where they can focus looking for, for planet nine. Still haven't found it. So then there's other theories. Well, the one that we, we mentioned earlier in the show, uh, the the people who've proposed Planet Nine like is that this could be a planet core. Big planets smashing into each other in the early ages of the solar system. The core of the planet being all that's left taking off into a slightly different orbit. So this is the other thing. It could have a weird orbit if it's a, from a big collision event like planets running into each other, planetary bodies running into each other. Why would it have it, a weird orbit? Because it smashed into something and so it could have a, a slightly different trajectory as it goes around and mm. the reason is pretty much everything out there is moving around in a pretty similar direction around so if something has a oh i forget what the, the what they call that orbit an orbit that's going counter or an off in a different direction mm -hmm. it's tougher to track because astronomers are used to it we'll look here we'll look here We'll look here, we'll look here, and incrementally tracking something as it moves across in a sort of recognizable way. So if it's got a weird, a, a different style of orbit, a different sort of uh, orientation, it could be harder for, for it to be tracked. It might show up in a frame, and then you go look for it again, and it's gone. Really hard to track. But this, this idea of then it could be much smaller and, this, this, and have all of this mass, which would make it difficult. There are also ideas that it could be a tiny black hole that's out there past mm -hmm. the Kuiper belt. Whenever there's a question in space, you always got to throw out the black hole option. Well, <laughs> hang on. So I, I've always liked this. <laughs> I've always liked this idea a little bit that there could be like a solar system out there somewhere that's just made up of different sized black holes over a much larger area than, of course, maybe a, a normal. Uh, solar system because the, you measure these things in solar masses 
in some thousands or millions of solar masses and you get a couple of these black holes and they could they could maybe be circling around each other in orbit. Why not? Problem is to get one that's in Earth masses, you have to have some exceptions or reinterpretations or different understandings of the standard model. It has been proposed by people who want to say, oh, we can go beyond the standard model if if we have all of these conditions that the standard model keeps winning. So it could be a black hole, but I don't think it is. But it would explain why we couldn't see it because it would be so small, we would never see this black hole. Others have said, maybe it's dark matter, a cluster of dark matter that's zipping around, uh, which is also one of those things that we haven't been able to detect right. visually, electromagnetically, infrared. We, we don't have a way to see that either. So if Planet Nine's any of those things, chances are we'll just never find it. Oh, but there's a story here. Uh, yes. This is... Uh, this is a uh, new sort of unconventional way of looking at the problem the detection approach being proposed by Man Ho Chan who's an assistant professor of something I couldn't find it Department of Science and Environmental Studies at the Education University of Hong Kong suggesting well, we could just look at tidal heating from satellites so if there is this massive object it could have satellites. The size of it, uh, based on uh, uh, Chan's estimates, could be as many as 20 satellites, 20 moons or orbital objects could be going around something that's the mass that they're suggesting that Planet Nine is. And if so, each time they went around Planet Nine, as they come closer, the ones that are closest, I guess, to the planet would have these large tidal effects, which would generate heat, even if, even if Planet Nine is a black hole or just a dark matter cluster, if it has orbiting things, they would still be affected by this, this tidal heating energy. And so there could be a heat signature of sorts that we could, we could read from the satellites. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting approach. Part of the, part of the maybe problem uh, of it is it would need to be that this tidal heating effect slows down over time. So these the more recent and closer to the planet that the orbiting satellites could be would be the the better this heating radio uh, spectrum could be possibly detected. So it's a very, Planet Nine's very old primordial universe creation. Those orbits may have settled down into a very low tidal energy orbit, then it would be invisible again. But still, it should be, it should be because of the mass that they propose, Planet Nine, if it has satellites, they should be hotter than anything else in the Kuiper Belt. Because there's nothing else that big. There's nothing else with that many, uh, with, the, with that, those sort of forces going on. So if there is this tidal energy uh, spike out there we should be able to see it separately from everything else so it's an interesting it's an interesting approach and because we have a pretty narrowed down orbital shell of where planet nine should exist eh, we, might, we might be able to narrow it down in how many years what do you think when are we going to find out what planet nine is so it's it's gonna probably take some luck. I, I'm wondering if uh, James Webb, yeah, uh, has a shot. But the problem is, it's actually, you know, why is it so hard to see something that's so close to home yes. when we're looking at uh, planets traversing mm -hmm. stars in distant, uh, distant uh, uh, parts of the the galaxy? It's because it's so close to home. Yes. Right? Yeah. You can. You you literally have every direction that you might have to look for this thing in. And you have to be looking at the right time. If you're pointing your telescope at a faraway galaxy, it's not moving. Yeah. You can just point at it and take as long of a picture as you want. It's not going anywhere. You, we might not know until we go there, huh? Yeah, so you might need to put 
They, well, that's the idea is it might take uh, uh, putting probes out past mm-hmm. the Kuiper belt. Yes. Uh, that can that can de- do the detection closer up, which would always help. But again, as, as sure as you as you move back that shell of orbiting the sun, mm-hmm. past the orbit of Neptune, past yeah. the Kuiper belt, that's a big shell. Certainly, you know that's starting to get into. There's no point in sending a probe out there. Thanks. Yeah, no, you have to you have to get a trajectory, and then you can send out a probe. So it's it's going to yeah. be a while. Yeah, but it but it might actually be easier to find the moons around a planet that we haven't found than finding the planet itself. Very interesting approach, mm-hmm. and I think it's I think it's a little bit of the out of box thinking that uh, hopefully gets it that because. Because Mike Brown is still in trouble, I think. I don't know how old his daughter is. It was at the time where she, when she was eight years old, had told him, come home from school one day. And was like, Daddy, you, you know how you can get people to stop hating you? And, you know, you hear that from an eight-year-old. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I'd be really, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't know. And why don't you tell me? Got to find another planet. Mm-hmm. And name it, and name it Pluto, I think. Yeah, but but no, you got to name it Persephone because that's Pluto's wife. Oh, there you go. Hades. That would be sweet. Anyway, Uh, okay. So I have one more story to close out the show. This is something that uh, Kiki texted me said she was very excited for me to report on. It is a very cool story. It is about male contraception. Um, and it looks like I closed the link <laughs> when I was meant to close something else. Um, anyway, it was a study done in mice, but uh, it's this kind of white whale of male contraception that could be used in humans that would be appealing to men and that wouldn't have lasting effects and that would be effective enough so that if you know you wouldn't have to stay on pills and if you missed a pill then it's it ruins everything right there's lots of barriers to creating male contraception even though this women figure it out but you know whatever anyway <laughs> wait a minute, um, you figure it out hey, hey 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 now wait a second yeah now wait a second i isn't it just that it's more difficult to create a contraception for for men or is it well let me let me get into it let me get into it okay so we've reported on on the show a few times with different methodologies there are various reasons that male contraceptions have not really come to fruition most of them do not have to do with efficacy i will say um but uh will cornell medicine pharmacologists have reported a male contraceptive that prevented 100% of pregnancies in mice allowed to mate just 30 minutes after the drug was administered. Rather than altering hormone levels throughout the body, the compound works by paralyzing sperm, which means that they can't move throughout the female reproductive tract or meet an egg. This was done in mice, but they actually think that clinical trials are pretty close. Um, This is the first time that there has been a drug that can inhibit sperm function without affecting production, which is one of the barriers is that um, there's a concern that any sort of male contraception would would be irreversible or would take a long time to reverse. And so this does not have direct impact on quality of sperm or sperm production. Um, So it can be used short term. It can be used on demand. There are no noticeable side effects. Um, they, they recognize that developing a working method for, um, this birth control is only part of the problem because birth controls that are nearly a hundred percent effective already exist for females, as I was saying, but these methods, methods only work by supplying the user with hormones on a constant basis. There's a bunch of issues with that. A lot of people don't want to be on hormones. And ultimately the, the lead pharmacologist on this study Lonnie Levin says, healthy people shouldn't be taking drugs unless they need them. So if you can have a a non-hormone way of providing contraception, that's a huge win. Here, here's the question. Here's the yeah. here's the question. Can you can you take it the day after? No. <laughs> We're getting to the, to how it works. 
<laughs> um, other male birth control drugs in development aim to limit the production of sperm. So again, that's not necessarily something that you want because that becomes effective after several months of taking the drugs. It takes a long time to curtail sperm production enough to actually impact uh, conception. And it takes another eight to 12 weeks after you stop taking it for the person to become fertile again, which is scary to some individuals. Um, again, it does take about that long, at least sometimes for women to become normal after, after stopping taking hormonal birth control. But that's beside the point. Um, so what they did is they proposed a compound that was an inhibitor for soluble adenylcyclase, SAC, which is an enzyme that exists in almost every cell across the body, but is particularly essential to the flagellum that sperm use to swim. Only, um, SAC is the only cyclase enzyme that is regulated by bicarbonate, which binds to a specific site on the molecule. So all this to say, they came up with an inhibitor that binds to that site that targets only SAC, does not affect other biomolecules, basically only makes the sperm bad at swimming. That's it. <laughs> they tested 350 different inhibitor cell lines on several different animal species, looked for ones that were safe and effective. Any that interfered at all with other parts of the body were thrown out. They tested in vitro and in vivo in the lab. They incubated human and mouse sperm with or without the inhibitor. Sperm exposed to the inhibitor had lower flagellal beat frequencies than uh, when they moved into a diluted solution without the inhibitor. They still weren't moving. They still were, were bad at moving around. So it was still good at sticking to the binding site. So next they did it in vivo. They injected the, the compound into 50 male mice. They waited 30 minutes. It only takes 30 minutes for this thing to work. Then they, uh, they put these 50 male mice along with 50 control mice into containers with females. And after giving the mice a mating period of a few hours, they removed the female mice. In the control group, 30% of the females ended up pregnant. Not one female mouse in the treatment group got pregnant. Also, the mice fertility, the male mice's fertility returned to normal levels the next day. So as soon as new sperm was created, the flagella were all good. There were no side effects displayed from the drug, even when they tried giving them repeated injections for several weeks. So in theory, this is something that you could take over and over and over and it wouldn't impact you. And then they, they tried an oral administration of the drug and found the same decrease in flagella beat frequency. So this mm -hmm. is in theory a pill that you could take. So essentially a man could take it with dinner on a date, <laughs> use it that night as contraceptive, know that his sperm will not be effective all the way potentially through the next morning. A day later, if he wanted to conceive, he'd be ready to go. <laughs> no, no, that won't work. <laughs> first of all, first of all, the half hour window much too long. Second, okay. secondly, <laughs> secondly, Justin, it, not if you're doing it right. <laughs> secondly, <laughs> secondly, uh, don't worry, I'm on the pill coming from a guy. Nah, don't trust it. No, lady, should I feel like this is the argument we date. always you, have, right? You're talking about but on also. A why not both? Yeah. Why oh, not well, of both? Of course. The so number this is... of accidental or, un I guess, unplanned pregnancies, mm -hmm. at least in the United States, is crazy high. Why not both? Why not as a, um, a man who's dating or as a woman who's dating or a, a person with sperm versus a person with eggs dating? Mm -hmm. You as that person can know that you have done what you need to do to take care of yourself. This is, I think the beauty of this is just putting the agency in each individual on their own. Like I, it's the pro con of, of being a woman in this case <laughs> is that I could take birth control and know I took birth control and I took care of myself. But again, 
you have to trust the other person when you say I'm on the pill. They go, okay, okay, great. But like this, this means if I am a man and I want to make sure that I do not create progeny, I do not do not want, I can take my own pill and I can be sure that that is not happening. Also, I will throw out there that if there is a non-hormonal option, let's go with that one. <laughs> if you, if you are in a trusting, equitable relationship and one of you has to be on a pill, and one of them is hormones and one of them isn't. The non-hormonal option is great. Don't let this happen to you. <laughs> Unless you want it to. Yeah. Only if you want it to. Anyway, um, they actually think that they'll be able to move into clinical trials within a couple of years. They are currently testing on rabbits, so they're moving up in their animal model escalation. They have a higher mating drive than mice, and um, so they think they'll be able to make more tweaks to the compound, strengthen its survival in the bloodstream, and make it a better candidate for oral ingestion. So um, the male birth control pill could be hitting shelves near you within a few years, which would be pretty cool. All right. Any last, last thoughts, Justin, before we close out the show? I think we did a, I think we did a very nice... Uh rendition of this week in science even without kiki which is too bad because i would have loved her insights on so many of yes. the stories the mushroom yes. story the cockatoo story the covid mm -hmm. story the space story all of it would have been great to have her here maybe uh we can get her to comment on some of it next week yes that would be great shout out to fada for his amazing help with social media and show notes Gord for manning the chat room, Identity 4 for, for recording the show, Rachel for all your amazing assistance, probably a little extra this week because the noobs on the device. And of course, we would like to thank our Patreon supporters. I do not have the list. So insert here, Kiki reading the list of our Patreon supporters. Thank you too. Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tozzi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard Chefstad, Hal Steider, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshack, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Clemmy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Dapp, E. O. Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Round of applause to our Patreon supporters. Yeah. On next week's show. We will be back broadcasting uh, at 8 p.m. Pacific time and again at 5 a.m. Central European time on our YouTube Currently, and Facebook channels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From no, it's two shows, isn't it? No. I always do that. No, no, hmm. it's just the one. Is it the same? Oh, I, I see how it works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, from twist.org slash live if you want to catch the show. Yeah, live and, and unedited. And if you want to listen to us as a podcast, perhaps while you gaze through your telescope, wondering. What is Planet Nine? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to stories are available on our website, www.twist.org. You can also sign up for a newsletter. It'll come out one of these days. You can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com. But, you know, maybe just email her and say, get, get better soon. Uh, Justin at twistmeanian at gmail.com or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Do not email me how to pronounce Don't do not do it. Don't do it. I, I know I can Google it. Um, but if you do email us, just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line or your email. Um, it'll be provided an inhibitor so that its flagella will no longer work and it will never get to where it's going. Oh, gosh. Uh, you can also hit us up if you like, uh, currently on the Twitter. I gotta get their handle for everything else. I think it's at Twist Science on the Twitter. 
as well as on one of the Mastodon universes. Yeah, yeah. Un- univer- Universodon? You, you, you know, something like versa- that. Therapy. I don't know. I don't have it. Uh, yeah, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, at Belair's Menagerie on the Twitter. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes through in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.